Welcome back to another episode of the Say It Out Loud podcast, and I am your host, Vasavi Kumar. So happy to be here, so happy to be recording this episode, speaking to you, talking to you, connecting with you, and um, I'm excited to get into it today, so let's do it. Okay, so one of the things that I'm, I'm fucking, what is wrong with me right now? One of the things that I have been loving, okay, so for those of y'all who need a structure as to how this podcast episode is going to go. Let me give you a little bit of structure. I want to first get into Inventing Anna. If you haven't watched Inventing Anna on Netflix, please watch it. I also want to get a little bit into Love is Blind. These are two shows that I am into right now. Inventing Anna, I already finished. Love Love is Blind season two is ongoing. Um, And I can't wait for the next episodes to come out this Friday. But um, I want to talk about those two. And then I want to share a little excerpt from my book, Say It Out Loud, which is coming out spring of 2023. If you're not already on the wait list, I will put that in the description of the podcast in the show notes. And um, then I want to talk a little bit about behind the scenes and what's been going on with me. And uh, I think many of you may be in this season right now where you're in words, like really, really in words. If you've been spending a lot of time in words, you're either loving it you're not loving it. Maybe you're having a combination of both, but there's always this question of like, oh my God, I'm really inwards right now. Am I ever going to like want to get back out there again? I want to first get into um, inventing Anna. Inventing Anna. What do I want to say about her? Well, if you read all the articles and if you see what other people are saying about her, they'll say she's a narcissist. They'll say that she's a sociopath, that she faked, she faked who she was being a German heiress and that she's awful and all, all this stuff. Right. And she was found guilty on many counts of, um, of the things that she was, um, she got prosecuted for a few things that she ended up getting, being found guilty for. Right. Um, but here's the thing about Anna, right? People want to go after her and say that she's a narcissist, which I'm not saying she's not, but how is she any different than any of us who go the other way? Hear me out. Anna had a hugely inflated sense of ego, right? But what about those who crumble in words, right? What about those of us that crumble in words? So I don't want to give away any spoilers, but Anna grew up in a house. This is not a spoiler. Actually, this is not a spoiler. It's just like, this is something that you'll already read on the interwebs. Anna did not grow up being accepted, right? Anna went from Russia to Germany and she really struggled a lot lot fitting in. This is what the show tells us. And according to her parents and what we hear, like she's, this is just who she is. She's this narcissist. She's a sociopath. She just doesn't care. Now, I think it's easy to look at someone like Anna and be like, oh, well, she's awful because she, you know, so-called swindled all this money from people and she um, was trying to raise all this capital for her for her dream project, which was the ADF, which was ADF at the Anna Delvey Foundation. How is she any different, though, than those of us who crumble inwards? Anna didn't have a strong sense of self. Anna wanted, Anna would, needed to create this persona of who she deeply wanted to be, which was a German heiress. She thought that being a German heiress would get her where she wanted to be, right? She wanted to create this foundation. She wanted to be impactful. She wanted to create this exclusive club for people. And she knew she needed money to do that. And so she thought, I, who do I have to be to get that? And she thought she had to be a German heiress to get that. And that's what she told everyone. And everyone bought it, okay? And if we bring this back to the individual, where in your life have you ever not felt like, have you ever not felt good enough about who you were? And so the image that you portrayed to the outside world was a shield from anyone ever having to get to know the real you, right? Anna... (laughs) didn't want anyone to know that she did not come from money. Anna did not come from money. Anna told everyone she came from money and her father was wiring the money. And she's just, she doesn't want anyone to see that who she really is, is this girl who, you know, doesn't have a lot of money. So she puts on this front as someone who does have a lot of money, but it's so easy to judge her, you know, like we do the same thing as human beings, as human beings, if we don't, 
if we identify with something within us, we either try to defend that identity or we try to argue against that, right? All Anna did was argue against it. She said, you know, I'm not going to be this poor person who uh, struggles with the money and who's just kind of lazy and sits around or do well, whatever her thing was. I'm going to be a fake German heiress. She never even thought she was fake. For her, she was just being who she thought she needed to be to get what she wanted. It was on a grander scale. Obviously, we're talking like $40 million here, right? But then if we think about, I, I thought about in my life, where in my life have I put on a front to be a certain type of way so that I can get what I wanted from somebody else? Where in my life have I put on a mask, a facade, a front, a persona, so as to get something from the other person? How are we any different than Anna? I know on the outside, it can feel like, oh my God, we're so much better than Anna on inventing Anna, right? I didn't, I didn't try to get $40 million from people, but you know, Anna just presented a version of herself that she knew would be able to get what she wanted. People chose to believe that because people do want to believe in something, right? I just think it's really funny how as a society, we judge these characters on TV and we're like, how could you, this person's awful. But it's like, if we look at ourselves, we're like, we do the same shit. It just looks different. Same shit, different toilet, as my dad would say. Anyway, I just feel like, you know, both stem from self-hatred, right? It's easy to look at Anna and think she's awful. Um, but all judgment aside, we all wear masks and pretend to be someone we're not. That's, that's what I got from this. I was, I, I watched the show. I can never just watch a show. I'm always like, how does this relate to me? How does this relate to the world? But it's true though. Like where have I invented Vasavi? Who is, well, what is the persona that I've invented that I've used throughout my life? I'd like to think I'm in a place now where I'm not like being someone who's not my fullest self, but I think we all have an opportunity to look at the masks that we wear. What are the masks that we wear to get what we want? How is Anna any different than us? And that's just what I wanted to say about that today. I really just, I had to get that off my chest about inventing Anna. Yes, Anna is probably a classic, she is a classic, classic, classic definition of narcissist and sociopath, but it's like, is she really? Is she really? Or is she just a young girl trying to make her way in a man's world? And she did what she had to do to get it done. I always love watching shows and looking at it through a psychological lens and asking myself questions like, how does this apply to me? Like, how can I relate to this character? It helps to kind of expand ourselves and not judge the other person so much. And it's actually a great way to, it's a, it's a great self-reflection tool when you watch certain shows that really like piss you off, um, which leads me to Love is Blind because there are two Indian people on Love is Blind right now. And I'm like, oh my God, I cannot even stand Abhishek who goes by Shakes on Love is Blind. By the way, there are probably going to be tons of spoiler alerts on this episode. I should probably tell you that. But Abhishek is this Indian guy who openly admits that he's like historically always dated white women. And physical attraction has always been his thing. Like he openly admits he's like superficial. He says he's very superficial. He openly says that. So he, 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 and for those of you, I'm sorry, I'm acting like everyone knows what Love is Blind is about. Love is Blind is hosted by Nick Lachey and his wife. I always forget her name. Nick Lachey, I forget his, oh, Vanessa Lachey. And um, the experiment is that, you know, these two people uh, start dating each other, but they don't know what they look like, right? Hence the term Love is Blind. And so they fall in love with their with the other person with their emotional side, with their, with their emotions, with who they are without even seeing each other. So- Two of the people on the show, Abhishek and Deepthi, Deeps, they fall in love and then they finally see each other. And Deepthi is Deepthi and Abhishek is Abhishek. But like throughout the the the, the show, Abhishek openly states like, oh, I, I'm not physically attracted to her. I don't feel this like sexual primal urge towards her, but I feel deeply, deeply connected to her. And she's sitting around saying like, oh, I just didn't want, like, I'm like, girl, you know, you cannot marry this guy. So this is my prediction for Love is Blind. Next episode coming out this Friday, they're about to stand at the altar. And I really resonated with Deepthi. Let me tell you why. I don't want her to get married to Abhishek. Let me tell you why. Abhishek loves her for the inside, right? But he's not so sure about her outside. He's not so sure if he's physically attracted to her. I think Deepthi deserves somebody who loves her inside and outside. And I would hate for her to go through with this marriage 
and the guy still doesn't want to have sex with her. Like, that's awful. Like, oh yeah, we're just best friends. Maybe the sex will happen. I don't know. Maybe they'll work. Indian people do it all the time in their arranged marriages. I don't know. My parents never had an arranged marriage. I never had an arranged marriage, but arranged marriages historically have worked for years versus what we call in Indian culture, love marriages. But the thing with Abhishek and Deepthi is that like Deepthi is waiting for him to like devour her sexually. Why should she sacrifice that sexual attraction, that physical attraction for a guy who's like lukewarm about her sexually, even though they're connected emotionally? Like I would want to be in a relationship with someone who's fucking hot for me. I want someone who is hot for me. And that is how I feel about Deeps and Abhishek on Love is Blind. I want someone who is hot for me. So Deeps, I want you to be with someone who is hot for you. I really do. And I don't know how I'd feel about that. I'm a physical touch kind of girl. I like one of the ways that I know that you love me is that you touch me. I need to be touched and I, I want to be caressed and I want to be my hair to be touched. And I want kisses. And like, I'm touching myself right now as I say this, but it's like watching love is blind makes me realize two things about my own love life, man. The first thing that is realized is how much I've settled in my life. I always thought I was the bitch in my relationships, but I realized what a doormat I've been. That's been the biggest, what I've learned from a lot of the women on love is blind. And as it relates to myself is like, oh my God, I've been such a doormat in so many of my romantic relationships. And here I was always thinking I was this like hard ass, this really like tough. Oh, I'm like so tough, but I'm a fucking doormat in my relationships. I'm like seeing that like, I'm, I am deeps. I am deeps. That's who I am. And I really feel that because she's just, she just feels so honored to have shakes be interested in her. And I'm like, okay, you're amazing. Like, why would he not be attracted to you? Why would he not want you emotionally? But then he's basically flat out saying to her, like, I don't really want to have sex with you. It's like, it's just like, I don't know. He's being honest, which is great. I just don't want her to marry him. I really don't. And so that's my, my prediction for love is blind. Here we go. If you're a fan, Danielle and Nick will definitely not get married. Um, Jarrett and the girl that he's with, Jarrett, She's like young. She's like, she's little. She's like short black hair. They will not get married. Shane and Natalie will not get married. I, I think well, uh, like one of them is going to say no. I, I don't, I think it's probably going to be Shane. Deepthi and Abhishek, I really hope they don't get married, but I have a feeling that Deeps is going to say yes. I just do. I just feel like she's so awestruck by the fact that um, Abhishek has a thing for her that she's just like, she's just She's okay with the fact that he doesn't want to like be sexual with her. Like he's not, he doesn't have that primal instinct. I'm like, I don't want to be with someone who doesn't want to have sex with me. I want to be with someone who wants all of me and, and loves me for my insides and wants better for me and is attracted to me and adds value. Not someone who's like, I really love your insides, but like, I just can't get aroused enough to like, like, no, I want it all. So I want that for deeps. So that's my prediction. My prediction is that she, no, my prediction is that deep says yes she's going to get married to him. My hope is that she doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't get married to him. He's, a, he's very extremely superficial. Anyway, that's my take on um, Inventing Anna and uh, Love is Blind. Watch it if you haven't. I have been spending a lot of time in words, you know, and realizing how much, how many things in my life I've put up with. Like there's always something for me to be like, man, I can't believe I put up with that for so long. And certain memories that I've repressed have been coming to the surface. And um, I've just been, a lot of things that I have ignored and swept under the rug have been coming to the surface, not only with in previous relationships, but also with myself where I um, suppress my own voice and I am a doormat, you know? Um, which is not something I'm proud of, but it's also not, it's just it what it what it is, right? I'm not even gonna say like, I'm not proud of it. I'm not like, it is what it is. Um, and that gives me freedom to say that. Like, I just, I like saying that because I'm not gonna sit and waste my energy on like, why did I do this? I don't like, no, I that's stuff that I used to do. I used to be a doormat. I used to let, I used to sacrifice so much of myself for my relationships. Um, and I always just thought I was being accommodating or I was being understanding but what I'm really like, man, I'm such a fucking doormat. I'm such a doormat. Like I'm, it's, it's a hard pill for me to swallow, to admit that I have been a doormat in many of my relationships. Um, and I don't want to be that way anymore. So 
there's been a relationship that's been very hard for me to let go of. It's been very hard for me to let go of. It's been like, it's like, if you think about like a piece of twine and it's like, you're on your last string, you're on your last thread. That's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm on my last thread. And like this weekend has been super um, anxiety producing for me. I've had a lot of friends be there for me. And I don't like asking, I don't like letting people see this anxious side of me because how people know me is, oh, you're confident. Things don't bother you. And so there's this side of me when it comes to my romantic relationships that is highly anxious, highly anxious of being left, highly anxious of being abandoned, highly anxious of being a, being a non-entity in someone's decision, right? Like you just don't even care about my feelings. And I've attracted and I'm drawn to people I'm attracted to and I attract people in my life who can play out that self-fulfilling prophecy, who are just characters in my play of life. I, uh, and, and, and so I've been spending this time kind of just looking at what is the narrative that I've created and who are all the, the men in my life, right? So one area of my life that I'm very focused on right now and just kind of uncovering is my relationship to my relationship to relationships. How am I in relationships with, with romantic partners, with part, you know, and I, man, this is a lot. It's, uh, I have a lot of regret and shame for things that I've done when I wasn't in a, in my right state of mind. I hold a lot of regret and shame. And what I'm doing is that what I'm, what I'm, who I'm being with myself is someone who is just like, Vasavi, you, you didn't know any better. <laughs> you didn't. The Vasavi that you've become today is not someone who would ever do or say the things that you said in the past in your relationships, right? Forgive yourself, forgive yourself, forgive yourself. That's what I keep telling myself. And I realize that the more I start to forgive myself and really forgive myself, right? Not just like in Hindi, uh, there's a phrase, the language Hindi called nam ke vaste. I don't just say sorry to myself, just like, oh, okay, I forgive myself. Like, no, like really forgive myself because when I forgive myself, I don't need to prove myself to anybody. And that's what I'm seeing is the connection for me. Wherever I'm still holding on to resentment, wherever I'm still holding on to resentment towards myself, wherever I'm still holding on to regret and shame about my previous actions towards myself, I overcompensate in those relationships. So for example, I have a relationship where I was a fucking bitch to my, to my guy. I was a fucking bitch. And I'm like, I'm not going to act like I'm a damsel. And it's like, for me, I was a bitch to this person that I, I was super unkind, super unhealthy at that time. When I met the last guy that I was with, I hold a lot of shame around how I treated him when he, all he did was love me. And I have been working on forgiving myself. Um, I realized that I want to make it right. I want to, I, I want to make it right with this person. And then there's another part of me that's like, do you really want to make it right with this person? Or do you just feel bad and you want to give it another shot for your own ego? That's something that I'm sitting with. I don't think that I ever gave the relationship that I had a fighting fair chance because I was not in a healthy place. I played the classic role that I always play of damsel in distress. And I attracted the perfect partner to be my hero. And then as I, so, so it just started off on extremely unhealthy foundation. You know, it was just, it was just, it's a lot. It's like three years in the making. And I'm like, oh my God, I was, I was shaming myself around like, am I still not over this yet? It's interesting how when fear of loss comes in, we all of a sudden want to make things right. And so I've been checking myself lately and talking to my friends and, you know, just been asking myself this question, do I actually care about this person or do I just care more that he's moving on or he may be moving on or I have, I haven't forgiven myself and I feel crappy. I don't know. It's just lots of things to think about, but that's, what's been going on behind the scenes. But in the process of doing that, I'm forgiving myself more. I'm, I'm forgiving myself for who I was and I'm celebrating who I'm becoming and make it right within myself and be the love that I want to be to attract the love that I want. That's what's going on behind the scenes. I want to go on to read an excerpt from my book, Say It Out Loud. This is the introduction. That'll give you a little bit of a background. I'm not going to get into it fully. I wanted to keep this kind of a shorter episode. I wanted to share one more thing that in the way that I've been running my business, I have found 
I'm always looking for ways to integrate more of myself and have it be super fun for me and my client. Like how do we bring the most holistic approach to your life and your business and your creative pursuits so you can feel fulfilled and satisfied? So I'm excited to just share this and put this out there that um, I'm now hosting weekends with Vasavi. So it's not, it doesn't have to be a weekend, but it's basically three nights and four days. Then you come to Austin and then I take care of everything else. Obviously there's a, a four figure investment. So this is a four figure investment. And um, I talked to a woman who um, wants to book a, a weekend with me and we talked through what it is. And it's, it's amazing because it's like, I want to show you that you can have fun and you can work on your business that, that in fact, being in touch with your body, moving your body is the key to you being successful, aligned and making values-based decisions in your life and business. So this is what it entails. It's you come in, I put you up in a king size room at the, in the Austin proper hotel. It's beautiful. And then we spend the next day at the Miraval spa all day, lunch, everything's taken care of. And we do a full day spa there, facials, massages, all the things. It's like great customized. And then the next day we work on your business, whatever that is, whatever idea that you have, whatever creative project you have, this is for people who pretty much already have an established idea. Um, this is not like, uh, or it's you, you have an idea and you just like, you really need help with mapping out the next few steps. Right. So it's like, if you were to work with me, you know, over the course of six months, but we do it in a VIP retreat, um, short amount of time, right? Three nights, four days. And the reason this is, especially for the person who's like, man, I know exactly what I want. I just need a little bit more clarity on that. Someone to extract that. And I really just need the plan and I'll work the plan. And I also want to have fun and I need to get away. So I take care of all of that for you. I also customize a few things. Like if you want to do a hip hop dance class, we can do a hip hop dance class. If you have some solitude time, alone time, but then you also have time with me and it's beautiful. We're spending the whole weekend together. If you are interested in a VIP re retreat with me, I'm going to say weekend, but just assume that it's any time during the week, three nights and four days um, with me, then just email info at vasavikumar.com, I-N-F-O at vasavi, V-A-S-A-V-I, Kumar, K-U-M-A-R.com, info at vasavikumar.com, put in the subject heading weekend with Vasavi and say, hey, I'm interested in a weekend with Vasavi and we will send you back, my team and I will send you back information about the weekend in Vasavi, with Vasavi. So I'm booking as far out as September right now. So if this is something you're interested in, then I would love to get you on the calendar for the weekend. And uh, yeah, I'm super stoked about this. I'm super stoked about this. It feels very aligned. And, and, and this is part of why taking a break and going inwards has been very good for me because it's I, I wanted to just redesign everything and how I do it. And this felt really good. This felt really good. Like I'm super pumped about it. Now, and the introduction to Say It Out Loud, the book. Vachi Pavam. My dad, when I look at my reflection in the mirror, I am still in awe. The woman staring back at me has become someone I created a beautiful partnership with. I respect and admire her for everything she has been through. From divorce, mental illness, addiction, and recovery, she has never left my side. It feels like a distant memory that just a few years ago, I would turn off my bathroom light so I wouldn't have to look at myself because I felt so ugly and filthy on the inside. My father unintentionally groomed me to be a professional damsel in distress. Growing up, I was frequently referred to as Pavam, which, translate, which translates to naive or poor thing in our native language called Tamil. When you're called a poor thing your entire childhood and well into young adulthood, something strange happens. You become a woman who's either waiting to be saved. You become a woman who is afraid to speak her truth. You become a woman who minimizes her desires or a woman who feels like it's her job to save others. I learned from a very young age that acting helpless would result in receiving attention from my father. It didn't hurt that I was born with a hole in my heart, which eventually closed up on its own or that I was a child that demanded a lot of attention. My father had a soft corner for me from the time I was born and any request I would make of him, he would oblige. At the end of four, I witnessed what I believed to be the beginning stages of learned helplessness. Having been 
born and raised in the United States, my mother would bring my older sister and I back to India every summer because she was adamant about us not losing our Indian culture. We would visit my maternal grandparents in Hyderabad and hail a rickshaw to nearby destinations. Our summers were spent learning classical Indian music and dance, eating, of course, and visiting Hindu temples. All of these experiences were pretty standard and normal for us. One day I was sitting in the rickshaw with my mother and sister. I saw a homeless man eating a banana peel, like just the peel from a pile of garbage. It was at that moment that I experienced a feeling of helplessness. I remember it like it was just yesterday thinking to myself, why do people have to suffer? And even further beyond that thinking, why can't I help him stop his suffering? It's no surprise then that I made it my mission from that age to be the solution for what I perceived to be people's helplessness. Even to this day, when I'm at a red light and see homeless people holding up a cardboard sign asking for money, I am brought back to that very moment. From getting my master's in special education to getting another master's in social work, I was on a mission to help the most marginalized members of our society. I often pick romantic partners who I deemed helpless and thought of as pavam. I always spot the red flags. I could always spot the red flags, but would often ignore my intuition and was even more attracted to my partners because of them. I had made it my mission to save everyone around me. I stayed in toxic relationships, which left me feeling even more helpless, often way longer than necessary or healthy for either of us. I had successfully created the tumultuous dynamic I witnessed between my parents and tried to heal my trauma through recreating them in my romantic partnerships. But the person I had to learn to heal and help and often avoided doing so was myself. I met with my first therapist, Virginia Cummins, at the age of 12. I had started smoking cigarettes and neither of my parents knew how to handle the situation. My mother would yell and my father would stay silent or try to keep her calm. Meanwhile, I was still trying to find my way in an all white school and lived in a constant state of stress and anxiety. One night while we were all standing in the kitchen amidst the post explosion, most likely fueled by me smelling like cigarettes and trying to cover it up. I said to my immigrant parents, I can't talk to you. I need to talk to someone. What I really meant was that it was loud inside my head. I needed someone I could talk to and unburden myself from the weight of my thoughts. From early childhood, our inner dialogue, self-talk, internal dialogue, or thinking to yourself, plays an essential role in how we think and behave. Romeo Vitelli writes, even though most of these inner dialogues stay well hidden, except for the occasionally embarrassing moment, inner speech is far more important than most people realize. Not only does it allow us to rehearse different scenarios and enable us to avoid rash actions, but it can also shape how we see the world around us. Have you ever spoken out loud the words you're about to use before a challenging discussion, a job presentation, or even ordering a to-go order? This isn't necessary. This isn't necessarily about rehearsing what you're going to say verbatim, which can lead I'm sorry, hold on. This isn't necessarily about rehearsing what you're going to say verbatim, which can lead to a watered down version of what you're trying to communicate. Saying things out loud helps you practice using your voice so that when it's time to have that discussion, give that presentation, or even place your favorite Thai takeout order, you're confident in using your voice no matter what the situation. From a very young age, I learned the power of talking things out. Even to this day, I'm not an avid journaler. I had to find my own way, a way to talk myself off the ledge of my own chaos creation. Pull up next to me at a red light and you'll often find me talking out loud to myself. There is power in saying our thoughts out loud. In a way, it allows us to hear the absolute lunacy of our thoughts. Step back and logically ask ourselves, is the way that I'm speaking to myself helping me or hurting me? From emotional control to stress, anxiety, uh, and depression management, our inner dialogue not only helps us overcome self-doubt and fear of failure, but it also appears to help us stay motivated. When I returned to playing tennis a few years ago, one thing became abundantly evident to me. How I spoke to myself on the court, both out loud and internally, had a direct impact on my performance. Whether we're playing a sport or attempting to sit down and practice a new instrument or read a book, our inner speech will either psych ourselves up or convince us to forget it and walk away. The question then becomes, where did our inner speech go as we got older? If as children, we could talk out loud to ourselves as a way to direct our behavior, at what point did we stop saying it out loud? Most likely when we first encountered a feeling of unsafety in our homes and with the adults who weren't emotionally capable of comforting us. If our inner speech guided our intellect and behavior as children, wouldn't it make sense that our inner speech spoken aloud leads us towards creating a values-based life? 
there's one way to find out. Hashtag say it out loud. So that's, I didn't realize how long the intro was. So what I think I'm going to do, I wanted to leave you with that. Yeah, this is like super, my intro is super long. Okay, y'all. So um, that's like the first part. Um, and I, I, it's not fully edited, but that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, I've written a lot of the book. I've written almost, I've written all of it. I just got to clean it up now, right? So that's my March April, May project before my manuscript is due in June, but I wanted to read a little bit of my excerpt to you and um, uh, remind you that, you know, this book is something that uh, it's like, I've been working on it my whole life because I've been saying it out loud my whole life. Right. So I really refined a lot of the ways in which I talk to myself and putting that in the book to help you talk to yourself out loud. I just did that with the client today. I had him talk his um, dialogue out loud to himself. I just sat there and looked at it and watched him do it. I was ta- told him how to talk to himself, but then we, you know, I was just witnessing him doing that. So it was beautiful. My goal is to have each and every one of you talk to yourselves out loud and um, integrate all the different parts of yourself. Every single voice in your head needs to be heard. I don't care what anybody says. They're all parts that exist within you and they need a voice. And it's up to you to actually create the space to allow all those parts to be heard. I, um, I truly believe, I truly believe that inside every single one of us, you know, we have all these different parts. They all have a voice. They all have their own personality. They all, they all have their own wants and needs and desires. And we can either squelch some of their voices and silence some of their voices because we don't like what they have to say, the voices inside, or we can give a platform for every single one of our voices to be heard by us. And that's where saying it out loud comes into play. So I really want to be able to teach you how to talk to yourself out loud. That is my saving grace. My saving grace in my life is the fact that I have, a, I have my, my, my practice, my daily practice. If there's one thing that I do daily, it is to talk to myself out loud. I take my inner dialogue, I put it outside of me and I converse with myself. So that habit has saved me in my addiction, in my relationships, even now, as I'm going through my own heartbreak, being able to really feel how I feel, not judge it, not make it wrong, um, is my voice is giving voice to my voice, all the voices inside of me, all the parts inside of me. I know I sound crazy, but those who get it, get it. Those who get it, get it. You all may, some of you may look at me and be like, what are you talking about? Voices in your head. Listen, if you even have to ask, you don't know. You don't know. Because if you, if you have spent enough time inside, then you know that there are multiple parts to you. And I'm just saying, let all those parts to you have a voice and be expressed so that you can pay attention, listen, be attentive, be present, give those parts what it needs to be heard, maybe to be listened, to be heard, to be listened, to be validated. And you can start to integrate those parts rather than hiding those parts. Anyway, that's an excerpt from the book. Um, I'm excited to share it with you. Um, Even reading it out loud felt like super good. It just felt really great to just read that out loud. Thank you, you know, for tuning back in to the podcast. This is my way of really connecting with you. I'm my, it takes time for me to actually sit down and record because I know that whatever I want to say on the podcast, I really just wanted to resonate with you and connect. And of course, if you have any questions, if you want to reach out, um, if you're interested in the VIP, uh, the three nights, four days with me, just email info at vasavikumar.com with subject heading uh, weekend with Vasavi. Um, And I look forward to connecting with you through the podcast. So this is my like main portal of communication. And then I disperse everything on my social media and in my email. So uh, it's an honor, honor and privilege to record this episode. Uh, for you. And, 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 and I hope that you got something from it. That's always my hope. My, my hope is that you get something from this podcast and um, hearing me share my own thoughts and experiences with you. So until next time, I love you. Take care. Don't forget to say it out loud.